So first, hello everyone. Welcome to Ahua Vets webinar. I'm the host from Ahua, and our company was established in 1994, and we focus on endoscopy system for almost 30 years. Now our goal is to make endoscopy di diagnosis and treatment more accessible and convenient. And our vet has monthly webinars on Zoom and also clinical cases on YouTube. And we aim to bring all the veterinary endoscope users together to share their knowledges and experiences. So just feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A chat box. Don't miss this opportunity. It's very precious. Okay, next, let me introduce our old friend, Dr. Vasiliki today. She is qualified from AUTH in Greece and her clinical interests, including canine feline gastro <coughs> gastrology, nutrition, and uh, diagnostic interventional endoscopy in companion animals. She holds a GP cert in small animal internal medicine and a GP cert in endoscopy and endosurgery from the International School of Veterinary Postgraduate and a PG cert in small animal medicine from Harvard Adams University in UK. And also, she is an invited speaker in multiple seminars, webinars, and also a trainer in gastroenterology and endoscopy courses in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Turkey. And she also awarded by AASCO. So I will give the host to you so you can share. Thank this you, story. Jason. Thank you very much. I welcome you all uh to this eighth i think jason uh <laughs> yeah. webinar and i'm seeing also please check the the q a uh box so that you can uh that you can answer to people as well um i welcome you all it's a huge pleasure today we're going to talk about uh, a bit of interventional endoscopy because up to now we were talking about more about diagnostic uh, procedures. So we're gonna talk about a very, very uh, dear to me topic, which is balloon dilations and uh, strictures in esophageal strictures in cats. Uh, before starting, I want to thank Alha for the uh, opportunity to come in contact with you. Um, whichever questions you might have, uh, just put them not in the chat box because that was disabled in the Q&A uh, box. And also, please do not forget to mention your preferred time if it's more convenient to do the webinars during the evening or if it's more convenient for you to, to do them in our uh, scheduled hour around noon so that we can schedule it for the upcoming uh, events. So let's talk about stricturing. Um, we're going to just uh, be uh, doing and uh, reviewing cases in the feline uh, patients, not uh, in dogs, uh, because for cats, esophageal strictures in cat cats are uh, have a multiple etiology uh, and causes and origin, and we're going to go uh, through that and explore it. So let's first talk about how the normal esophagus is. And I know that a lot of you who attend uh, this uh, webinars already scope, but let's just do a bit of re refreshing. Uh, so the uh, esophagus has the normal mucosa of the esophagus is pale, pink, smooth, and glistening. Um, it's a lumen that's even, um, does not have um, granularities that not have lumps and bumps. So uh, in normality, it's a very, very smooth uh, lumen. And of course, it's it doesn't have, it doesn't contain any uh, food, any fluid, or it shouldn't contain any food or fluids, uh, bile or gastric contents. It could be, you know, it could have some small amounts of saliva, um, but if you see uh, 
esophageal content, then this is pathological. Uh, we can see the tracheal identification as landmarks in the first uh, part of the esophagus. The tracheal uh, rings sometimes are visible. Watch out, don't overinflate your uh, ET tubes uh, because they're really prominent in the esophageal lumen. It doesn't make your procedure more difficult, but it's, uh, it gives you a hint that you have overinflated your uh, ET tube. Okay, of course, always under sedation, um, your procedure, your esophagoscopies, okay, general anesthesia and uh, intubation. So under sedation, we could have a mild peristaltic wave. Most of the time, the lower esophageal sphincter is closed. And in cats, we have a better visualization of the blood vessels. I'm going to show you some scope, some scopes, uh, some endoscopies of normal uh, cats. And uh, the very, very characteristic part of the uh, of the, the feature of the feline patients is that in the distal third of the feline esophagus, we have these rings. Um, these transverse uh, transverse folds uh, that are associated with uh, smooth muscles. So this is how it looks. This is the last third of the uh, esophagus in cats. Okay, and you see how prominent the vessels are in cats. So you can easily distinguish between feline and canine patients, even if you don't see the outside and you only see a lumen. And let's go and see how a normal esophagus looks like. So you see the vessels here that are really prominent in the cat. In dogs, you cannot see the vessels. This, this is not pathological here in this cat. And you can see these transverse folds, these rings in the distal esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter should always be closed, so watch out your anesthesia. And also, this is not gastroesophageal reflex, this here that we were seeing before, it's the Z line. So please be cautious uh, into evaluating the Z line as uh, esophagitis, as gastroesophageal reflex disease and consequent esophagitis. And what about the esophageal uh, stricture? What is an esophageal stricture? Most of the cases that come to us uh, come with a, are admitted with an already formed stricture. So there is no active esophagitis at that point. There is this, this fibrous connective tissue already formed. Um, and the definition is the pathological narrowing of the diameter of the esophageal lumen and the production of fibrous connective tissue, which is very, very uh, strong and uh, hard and very, very difficult to dilate. If you're very lucky and you touch it in the, the beginning, if you're you know, aware of the disease and you might, for example, you have a cat that's that has been chronically vomiting or a cat under... Uh, that has undergone um, a surgical procedure during the last two weeks, for example, and this crosses your mind as a differential diagnosis for a regurgitating cat or for a vomiting, as the owners will say, cat, uh, then you have the chance to intervene very, very uh, in an immediate uh, way. So as you see here in the x-ray, we have a dilation, a dilation cranially to the stricture, this is the stricture uh, point. Uh, we have a dilation of the esophagus, which is a mega esophagus actually, but it's a mechanical um, uh, phenomenon here. And it's not uh, a, a, mega a functional uh, mega esophagus. So uh, we have a dilation of the, um, of the esophagus just proximal cranially to the uh, stricture. And of course, some of the contrast medium passes through the stricture. And this is the stricture. And you can see this band, this whitish band. Um, that's the connective tissue. And you see how dilated the esophagus is just behind this uh, band. I'm not going to talk a lot about pathophysiology, but I always like this hydraulic, you know, uh, phenomena. So um, it all has to do with 
the viscosity, the length of the tube, and the pressure difference. And this is how the flow is determined, actually. Um, we have a differentiation of the strictures depending on whether they are benign or malignant. So benign strictures may occur after severe esophagitis due to chronic vomiting, due to um, gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease, um, uh, due to foreign bodies, and then after the removal of foreign bodies. So these are benign uh, strictures, esophageal strictures. Uh, Drug-induced as well in cats, as we will uh, say later on. We also have malignant uh, strictures from uh, a neoplastic tissue that's proliferating and obstructing the esophageal lumen. There's also a distinction between congenital and acquired, uh, intramural and extramural. And of course, extramural strictures are from outside, like for example, vascular ring uh, anomalies, or sometimes we have um, um, enlarged enlarged uh, lymph nodes in the lungs that are compressing the uh, the esophagus from outside. Um, and beware of the last category, because we can have one single stricture lots of the times, most of the times, but we can also have multiple strictures, especially in cats. So when you're done with dilating one stricture, please uh, go through the whole length of the esophagus and check because you might have another one, especially when you have gastroesophageal reflux disease or uh, intractable vomiting, vomiting that, that, that cannot be controlled with any means, with any antiemetic. Uh, in this case, you might have uh, esophagitis up to the pharyngeal sphincter. So uh, in these cases, we might have multiple strictures along the way, along the length of the uh, esophagus and be uh, aware of that. So what are the clinical uh, signs? Most of the uh, animals that are admitted to our clinics have progressive regurgitation. As I told you, some owners might think that this is uh, a vomiting, that these are vomiting episodes and that are not regurgitation episodes. You have to define it for them and you have to clarify which is, what is the difference between regurgitation and vomiting, or you can tell them to send you a video of what the uh, the kitten or the cat is actually uh, presenting as a clinical sign. Dysphagia, uh, especially in, um, in the first stages of esophagitis, we might have odinophagia, uh, which means that we have a lot of pain uh, during swallowing, extension of the neck. A cat I've also told in a lot of webinars that a cat that's protruding like this, extending the neck and doing ptialism all the time uh, is very, very highly suspicious of esophagitis and triaditis as well, but um, of a gastrointestinal uh, problem, of a gastrointestinal disease. Okay. Um so in, in the beginning, the liquid meals or the canned meals are tolerated better than the solid uh, dry food meals. But in the end, as the disease progresses and the stricture becomes uh, even smaller, then sometimes they cannot even tolerate water. And of course, sometimes we might have some of these animals are presented with aspiration, pneumonia and fever. Um, because they have this dilation of uh, esophagus just proximal, just cranially to the, to the stricture. And most of these patients are force fed by their owners because um, they, in, in the beginning, they have a ravenous appetite, but then as the disease progresses and they have severe esophagitis and they become, uh, they do not eat anything, they become anorexic. And especially if they uh, develop fever. And of course, we have um, in the more chronic cases, we have weight loss and malnutrition. So please, um, in your differentials, when we see the causes, always put, put this as a possible uh, differential in order to manage it in the first, in the beginning, in the first, in the early steps of the disease. Okay, let's watch this one. This is a kitten that was admitted to my practice. 
and this is my voice. I'm sorry, this is my assistant. And this owner kept telling me that this cat is vomiting. This small kitten is vomiting. Um, and I didn't believe uh, that it was vomiting. So I said, okay, let's feed the cat and see what's going on. You see that this small kitten has a ravenous appetite, is really, really hungry. I mean, it, grow, it could eat actually our hands and the bowl by itself. So this cat, um, this small kitten had uh, upper respiratory uh, tract uh, uh, disease and uh, it was administered uh, doxycycline uh, for uh, two weeks. This is the common, you know, the most common uh, in kittens. When you see kittens uh, that have strictures, it's either congenital, which is rare in uh, feline uh, patients, or they have been treated with some kind of an antibiotic on a dry swallow. So this has happened, but the, the general practitioner, the first opinion, uh, the referring vet and the owner could not connect these two uh, incidents. The fact that it took for two weeks um, antibiotic and the fact that this cat uh, had these regurgitating episodes. Okay, and let's see now, just five minutes after, not even five minutes, I mean, the minute we stopped feeding, the kitten started having nausea. And it's very, very, um, it's extremely, it's presented in feline patients with uh, a clinical manifestation of vocalizing, of uh, hopping all around and jumping all around, like as if they have seizures with hypersalivation and uh, as if they have something like a foreign body in their mouth and they cannot stand it. So it's the, the clinical manifestation of that is very, very uh, extreme and prominent. And you see that this poor cat is hypersalivating. And of course, it expelled all the content of the canned food passively and with foamy material around it. And this is where it gets dangerous for aspiration pneumonia as well, because you saw this cat and the symptoms. And of course, they are going to eat it again. This is very, very characteristic in these patients. They're going to eat it because the content has not undergone all the procedures of the gastric uh, fluids of the stomach. So it's still food. And I have to remind you that these uh, cats are really, really hungry because they are not being fed properly. The food does not reach the stomach. And we have the same case here with this one, this little fellow here. I'm so sorry when I see these patients, you know, they're so small, so tiny, and they're suffering. And you saw how it expelled passively the food and it starts consuming it again. I'm sorry for those who will have dinner in a while. Hope it's not that disgusting for you, but we are vets after all. So causes of uh, esophageal strictures. We have two big categories, okay? The intraluminal causes uh, of the stricturing and the extraluminal, we're, we're gonna talk about that later. So the intraluminal uh, strictures could be caused by gastroesophageal reflex disease during general anesthesia. And especially if uh, we have intra-abdominal uh, manipulations and surgical uh, procedures because this enhances the chance of having gastroesophageal reflux and severe esophagitis. And as a consequence of esophagitis, then we have the stricturing. Uh, so beware of your cats that undergo general anesthesia, even for, for uh, procedures that do not have to do with uh, abdominal uh, manipulations. For example, if you want to, to clean uh, an abscess in a cat, uh, it has been, uh, we had cases that strictured, that developed a stricture right after 
any uh, anesthetic episode. But of course, the incidence is higher in intra-abdominal uh, manipulation operations. Prolonged vomiting or gastric content that can cause esophagitis as well. Drug, caustic substances, chemical irritants uh, that can induce esophagitis as well. And we're going to talk about this specific category of drug-induced uh, stricturing. Esophageal foreign bodies and, of course, neoplastic. The, th the first three are benign strictures and we have the neoplastic stricturing in the end that's intraluminal. Uh, where do they present? Where do we have the strictures? So the strictures are where physiologically the esophagus is getting a bit narrower, and that's in the thoracic inlet, um, 5 to 10% centimet centimeters cranial to the lower esophageal sphincter, and also um, uh, the base of the heart and just cranial to the lower esophageal sphincter. So these are the three actually spots that we can, the three sites that the esophagus anatomically uh, normally has uh, a smaller diameter. Okay, and this, these actually are where the sites of the foreign body, uh, where the foreign bodies are lodged. So it's, it's only uh, natural that these will be the sites of the stricturing as well. And we're going to take each cause uh, step by step, and we're going to see some uh, cases uh, for each cause. So uh, in a series, we have a lot of uh, studies uh, in the uh, gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease, especially in cats undergoing general anesthesia. And we had a series of seven cats with benign uh, esophageal strictures, and they had undergone uh, nutrient ovary hysterectomy um, in five of those cases. So you see that it's not only in the intra-abdominal uh, operations because that's the perception. And of course we had decreased lower esophageal uh, sphincter tone as a result of the uh, anesthetic agents that were used throughout the operation and direct acid injury to the esophageal mucosa. So it has been proven that pre predisposing factors are head down position during the operation and intra-abdominal surgical manipulations. A lot of people ask me that, uh, what if I give, for example, PPI inhibitors uh, before the, um, the nutrient or in the anesthesia? It has not been proven that it helps a lot uh, for the reflex disease, but um, you can give it, and we now know uh, that uh, especially uh, meprazole and nor the PPI inhibitors can alter the uh, intestinal microbiota. So we are a bit uh, more cautious by giving and prescribing long-term uh, the uh, PPI inhibitors. Uh, but once you see that after an operation, two or three days, the cat starts salivating or starts tylism because this is how it starts, then you can prescribe them. Okay. And in one study, they have, I, if if Yanis Savas from the university was were here, he hates laryngeal masks, so do I. Um, and the use of laryngeal, I know that many of you use laryngeal masks in cats, but unfortunately, um, we have more of gastroesophageal reflux disease with these masks rather than the ET tube. Okay, the endotracheal intubation. So in one study, the use of laryngeal mask uh, airway devices in 40 cats um, resulted in 50% gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease compared to 22% uh, of the cases with uh, ET tubes. You see that even with the ET tubes, we cannot avoid having gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it depends upon your um, induction upon your um, the maintenance of your uh, anesthesia. And I wish that at some point we will have an anesthesiology to have an interactive talk in these cases. Um, so clinical signs appear up to 20 days after the anesthetic episode. So don't be, um, if you have done an intervention, a surgical intervention to any cats, to any cat, to any feline patient. And even a month later, they come 
saying that this cat is regurgitating because or vomiting because they don't know what regurgitation is, always connected to your prior anesthetic and surgical uh, procedure. And um, most of the owners will see signs during the first 10 days, but they will not be that prominent. Okay, it will be like uh, sporadic vomiting, they will say, which is sporadic regurgitation, maybe ptyalism, uh, hypersalivation, and these will be the primary uh, signs. So the endoscopic findings of uh, esophagitis, increased hyperemia and uh, more vascular, the, the, the vascularity is more prominent uh, in these cases in cats, discoloration of the mucosa layer, friability, which is, you know, in the esophagus is a bit difficult to assess uh, how friable it is because uh, this can only be assessed once we are taking biopsies. Uh, and it's a very difficult organ to uh, to take biopsies uh, from. We can have hemorrhages, we can have ulceration, uh, we can have uh, superficial uh, erosions throughout the length of the esophagus, or if we have uh, GERD disease, it will be confined in uh, the area proximal to the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and of course, we can have secondary functional megaesophagus because when we have esophagitis, this causes esophageal dysmotility disorder and the presence of pseudomembranes covering the mucosa. And I have a case to show you, an endoscopic case. And uh, as I told you, most of the cases of uh, gastroesophageal reflex disease is located cranially to the uh, gastroesophageal junction. Yet having said that, we have a lot of cases that have intractable vomitings and uh, that have such a prominent gastroesophageal reflex disease that um, the, the gastric acids uh, go up to the length, uh, throughout the length of the travel, throughout the length of the esophagus and reach up to the pharyngeal uh, sphincter. So it depends on the amount of the uh, gastroesophageal uh, uh, content that's of the gastric content that's reflexed in the esophagus um, and on the uh, underlying pathology. Okay. And as I told you before, please beware of the Z line. This is the line of the stomach. This is actually, um, this is a normal border between the esophagus and the stomach. And it is not a lesion. This is where the uh, mucosa, the esophageal mucosa, uh, transitions to the gastric mucosa. If you have any questions, please pose them in the uh, Q and A's. I don't mind answering questions, you know, in order to have an uh, an interactive uh, session. If you wanna, if you have any questions on what we're commenting, uh, please pose the questions and we will answer them. So there are two grading systems. Actually, there are more in humans, but the uh, most commonly used ones, the most frequently used ones, are the uh, new Savary Miller endoscopic grading system. This is the one I use. Um, and it goes like grade one, we have one single erosion or exudate um, in one fold only. Um, in grade two, we have multiple non-circular non erosions. In grade three, we have circular erosions throughout the circumference of the uh, esophagus. Uh, grade four, we have ulcers. We have uh, bigger, you know, not only superficial uh, erosions, but deeper ulcers in the esophagus. And grade five, we have Barrett's uh, esophagus, which is, you know, gastric metaplasia of the esophagus. And yeah, do we have it in cats? Yes, we do. We have found uh, Barrett esophagus. It's it's rare, um, but we have found Barrett esophagus in cats as well. In humans, Barrett esophagus is a very huge deal because it's a precancerous uh, uh, state, actually, of the esophagus. And there's also the Los Angeles classification system for esophagitis, uh, grading from A to D. Uh, going from the um, from the lesions that uh, the, you have maybe one or more mucosal breaks no longer than five millimeters um, and not uh, bridging the tops of the mucosal folds, as you see here. So there are different systems, but we uh, most most commonly use the Savile Miller uh, classification. Let's see this esophagitis in a cat. You see that due to the esophagitis, 
um, the esophagus has lost their rings, its rings, and also they it has lost the vascularity. We cannot see the vessels uh, due to the thickening and the inflammation. So this is a, a Persian cat, three years old, um, and it has gastroesophageal reflex disease due to a prior anesthetic episode. And what I'm doing now is that I just saw while inspecting the esophagus that a, a, you see here that a band started forming just proximal, proximally to the cranially to the lower esophageal sphincter. And this would be the place that if I scope this cat one week later or 10 days later, it would have a stricture. So I go with uh, a diameter, with a big diameter of, uh, of uh, uh, an end endoscopic uh, equipment of my scope. And I go up and down in order to just destroy this band that just started forming. And of course, we will have to see that again. We will have to re-examine this cat uh, in the later stages. You see that... Um, the esophagitis lesions, like the ulcerations, are, are going up to the uh, thoracic uh, implant, to the base of the heart. Um, and of course, this is, as I told you, after an anesthetic episode. This is now, you see here is the, the ring that's going to be um, developed. So we caught it in very, very early stages because one week after the anesthetic episode where the cat had thialism, had odinophagia, it just came to the clinic. And of course we um, combined the operation with the symptoms and we said, okay, let's go in and see if um, a stricture is being formed. And we caught it very, very early. So the question of the referring vet was, um, Will okay, we, you say that we have esophagitis due to an anesthetic episode. Are we going to sedate this cat again? Um, isn't there a danger, you know, into uh developing a more severe esophagitis due to gastroesophageal uh, reflex disease? Of course, there there will be more reflex at this point, but it's more crucial to determine what's going on if a stricture is already being formed, as I saw it now in the beginning, so that we can go more aggressively and treat it and manage it so that we, we will not proceed into balloon dilations later. Okay, because you will see that the esophagitis can be healed in two or three uh, days time. The esophagus has an amazing ability to uh, heal these ulcers that you're seeing here, there as uh, esophagitis. So yes, there is uh, an anesthetic, uh, the, the risk of, you know, having more uh, reflex disease, but there's always, you know, you have to balance it and um, have your diagnosis. And I also detected the beginning of the band of the stricture there, and I dilated with the tip of my scope. Okay. And in terms of Barrett esophagus, um, uh, the development, it's the development of metaplastic uh, columnar epithelium that replaces the normal uh, squamous epithelium, okay? Um, we have three cats reported to have Barrett-like uh, esophagus in which two of them have had hiatal hernia and uh, one had cardiac failure. And of course, it's the most commonly, the most commonly reported uh, cause of uh, Barrett uh, esophagus in uh, humans are the gastroesophageal reflex disease. And in humans, it's mostly, um, there's there's always, uh, almost always a hiatal hernia, a herniation. Okay. And the true incidence in cats, we do not know because we do not biopsy actually the esophagus. Um, and we had uh, this Persian cat, eight years old, with lymphoma and chronic gastroesophageal reflex disease with Barrett esophagus. You see the lesions here, and you see the metaplasia. You see this is gastric epithelium, actually, in the uh, metaplastic epithelium, to say it even better, uh, in the esophagus. And this is a, a hyperthyroid cat with chronic vomiting and uh, Barrett disease as well. And most, of course, of the of the lesions are not most. All of the lesions are at the gastroesophageal junction. 
Let's go to another one. And I really, really want you to be cautious about that one. Um, I know that most of the, uh, that there is a lot of awareness nowadays about giving uh, antibiotics in general. And secondly, about primarily, and secondly, about giving antibiotics in cats on a dry swallow. And we used to think that it was about um, doxycycline, for example, or clindamycin, uh, for example, because for these two antibiotics, we had a lot of uh, research going on. Uh, and also a lot of cases, a series of cases report that were actually uh, giving evidence about what clindamycin and doxycycline um, and doxycycline could uh, actually uh, do to the uh, esophageal mucosa. But it actually is, this is not, you know, so simple. Every peel in the cat, every peel that you will use in the cat, even the antiparasitic uh, peels that you give for deworming in your uh, practices, they should be followed by water. And it has been actually calculated the amount of water for uh, to, to, um, to give to a feline patient in order to swallow a pill is around seven ml uh, of, uh, of a water in a syringe. Or if you don't want to risk your life with a cat giving you know water uh, in a syringe, just give uh, a small uh, amount of uh, food. Okay, so it's very well, uh, pill-induced uh, esophagitis is very, very, uh, uh, is well documented in humans. It's an entity that's very, that has, been researched a lot uh, with over 70 drugs. When I when I went to, uh, across the literature, you know, to find out what's going on in humans, uh, there was a list, a huge list or, of 70, 80 drugs that can cause uh, drug-induced stricturing, benign stricturing in humans, um, esophagitis. And as I say here, that stricturing is very rare in humans, but very common in, uh, in cats. And antimicrobials and non-steroidals uh, are implicated in 50% of the published cases, okay, in uh, in humans. Uh, what about the uh, benign esophageal stricturing in cats? So we know about oxytetracycline, about doxycycline, about clindamy uh, clindamycin. We have research, uh, research uh, papers about that, but we do not, this is not evidence-based. We know their result when we give them, but it's not evidence-based. And always on a dry swallow. This happens when we give pills on a dry swallow. So prolonged, what, what could be the underlying uh, mechanism? Maybe prolonged contact of the esophageal mucosa to a drug and its direct chemical uh, effect. And uh, because we have seen, for example, that parenteral administration or, or subcutaneous injections of uh, uh, amoxicillin or parenteral administration of these drugs uh, do not cause esophageal, do not have the same results. So it has to do with a topical effect in the esophageal lumen. And the, the esophagus, the esophageal mucosa has a lot of protective uh, mechanisms to drugs like the uh, esophageal mucus bicarbonates, uh, the multiple layers of the esophageal epitheliums, the strong cell-to-cell uh, -cell connections, uh, the intracellular lipids. So there are a lot of protective mechanisms uh, to uh, undergo uh, for these drugs to actually cause uh, erosive um, uh, ulceration, uh, erosive lesions and ulcerations in the uh, esophagus. Um, in terms of doxycycline, uh, it creates, it has been proven that it creates an acidic solution in uh, the neutral esophageal pH. So this is corrosive and uh, this ulcer forming uh, effect uh, has been experimentally documented. And also we see it in our everyday life, but of course in science it's, it's a different procedure, you know, to uh, evidence-based, uh, to, to, ba to base under evidence all of these data. And um, we have toxicycline accumulation in the basal membrane of the uh, esophageal uh, squamous epithelium. So in, in terms of doxycycline effect, it has an acidic um, uh, effect on uh, an ulcer forming effect on the uh, esophageal mucosa. And let's see this one here. 
This is Oscar, a two years old male cat. And you can see these pseudomembranes here. And this is very, very high up in the pharyngeal, um, just after, it was like one centimeter after the pharyngeal sphincter. So the peel, this cat was treated with uh, doxycycline um, for respiratory uh, tract disease and uh, for upper respiratory disease, nasal discharge, and uh, this uh, combination of diseases, ocular discharge. So they gave him blindly uh, doxycycline. And a week after the administration of doxycycline, uh, it started uh, having odinophagia, very painful swallowing. The cat was vocalizing and it was, you know, like it was really in pain. And, um, most probably the pills have been stuck here in the pharyngeal region and they have caused by a caustic, a chemical effect, they have caused these pseudomembranes, necrosis of the esophageal uh, area. So in the upcoming, and of course this cat had pharyngeal regurgitation, the stricture is not that prominent here, but if we left it, for example, of course there is a stricturing of the esophagus, but not that prominent as the strictures that we see already formed with a, with a band, because this is in the beginning. These are at the stage of pseudomembranes. And this, if we just left it like that, and let's say, for example, that the owner or the, the veterinarian prescribed uh, only uh, food, uh, canned food, this cat would be able to uh, actually swallow canned food and it would proceed. This procedure would go on, progress, and it would form a very firm stricture. Okay. And of course, with the tip of the scope, you can um, just destroy all these lesions. We took some biopsies as well in order to verify that this was necrotic tissue and not something else. And this is another cat, Shiba. This cat is three months old. Um, got doxycycline um, as well for upper respiratory uh, tract infections. And you see, this is very, very, in the very beginning of the stricturing, we uh, have pseudomembranes again, okay? And the stricture has already been formed, but it's very easy to manip manipulate without balloon. Only with the tip of the scope, you go up and down, up and down. And if you have a colonoscope, if you have a bigger scope, bigger diameter scope, and not just one scope, because this was a, a small kitten, you know, we use the bronchoscope. And then I went with the eight millimeter scope uh, and opened it a bit wider uh, so that it can stay. And of course, these uh, patients have to be re-examined in three or four days because the stricture and the stricture will be reformed. We know that for sure. And of course, they should be given a very, very aggressive treatment for uh, esophagitis in order to avoid this restricturing. And clindamycin does not alter the, uh, the pH, has a totally different mechanism and causes minimal mucosal irritation. So the etiopathogenesis of uh, how the, street, the benign strictures are formed from uh, clindamycin is the increased transit time through the esophageal lumen and the increased duration uh, of contact with the esophageal mucosa, which means that clindamycin has a more mechanical uh, effect and this happens with a lot of other peels. We have, um, I will show you one of my papers published um, that we had the same effect with uh, um, amoxicillin and clavulanic acid, which is not clindamycin. It's due to the mechanical effect and the fact that peels, I will show you what the transit time of peels is in cats, take so long, I mean, more than three hours sometimes if we just give them in, on a dry swallow, to uh, proceed from the esophagus into the stomach. So they remain embedded like foreign bodies in the uh, esophagus and they cause, this is how they cause uh, the, um, the esophagitis. So we have the dry swall swallow, we have the esophageal hypermotility, maybe if the cat is a bit dehydrated, maybe if we have another systemic disorder. And also there is the formulation that plays a 
great role, like the captions, for example, or the, is it in tab form? Is it in capsule form? This plays, is it in, you know, because the same drug in syrup form will never cause a stricturing because it's not out of the alteration of the pH, as we said, it's more of the mechanical effect. And giving in cats human drugs that you cut in half because they are, for example, cheaper, uh, in terms of uh, doxycycline, for example, we have this uh, drug that's called vibramycin, uh, and it's a human drug. And when you cut it, you can give it to, to cats as well. But the thing is that once you cut it, uh, this, this uh, peel has um, a cover. You destroy the cover, first of all. And the second thing is that once you cut it, then it becomes very, very sharp and um, this actually can cause mechanical uh, irritation to uh, the uh, the esophagus out of uh, being embedded there. And this is the um, uh, this is the article that we have uh, actually uh, peer peer review uh, article that we have uh, uh, published. And it was with, uh, we had three cases, we present three cases, one with clindamycin, one with doxycycline, and one with amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. In humans, it is one of the implicated uh, drugs as well. And the mechanism is similar to that of clindamycin, as we said, because they cause mechanical uh, problem due to the transit times. And this was our cat. We had mega esophagus cranially to the strictures, to the stricturing and uh, you see how small the stricture uh, was. There was, I couldn't even pass a urine catheter, uh, a dog urine catheter from this uh, stricturing. Okay. Dry solo of capsules uh, or tablets in cats can result in retention of the drug. This is what I want you to remember. For a duration of uh, 30, 30 uh, to uh, 240 seconds. So it's a long time. It's a really, really long time. Um, and uh, in a different study, more than 50% of capsules administered to healthy cats were trapped in the cranial thoracic esophagus. So these, this is why I mentioned your uh, antiparasitic peels. Okay. Um, and um, a competitive st study demonstrated that if we want to give the peels, then we could uh, uh, at least give them with one step bill gun with flavored liquid or with these uh, pockets, with these peel pockets, so they can, they, they can transit uh, and they can travel through the esophagus easier. Um, so this will give with this will ensure less than 60 uh, seconds. And of course, the trick with the watcher, as I told you. And we can have a benign stricturing due to esophageal foreign body. And of course, um, in cats, esophageal foreign bodies are less commonly found um, in the esophagus compared to other uh, sites of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, what are the foreign bodies that we commonly see in cats? Uh, strings, needles, fish, uh, fish hooks, uh, bones, Trichobezoars, don't forget about it. If a trichobezoar is um, uh, is really, really firm and hard, then it can act as uh, a simulation of a foreign body. They can be lodged uh, anywhere in the uh, esophagus. Okay. And of course, the common locations, uh, again, are the thoracic inlet, the heart base, the uh, esophageal hiatus uh, in the diaphragm, which is cranially to the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and chronic esophageal foreign bodies have been reported with intermittent regurgitation of, um, uh, for example, uh, trichobezoars. Okay, and they cause esophagitis and then uh, stricturing. Always, always look underneath the tongue. This is a trichobezoar uh, that has been embedded in the esophagus, and these are the linear foreign bodies, okay, that can cause gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease. Of course, they cannot cause 
uh, intraluminal uh, obstruction of the esophagus, these linear foreign bodies, but they can cause intractable vomiting. And this is how the stricturing comes. Um, always sedate the cats with ptyalism and hypersalivation in order to think, to see what's going on underneath the tongue. And this is um, a 10 years old uh, male uh, cat uh, that actually had uh, a string, as you can see here, going from the esophagus to the stomach to the small intestine. And do not push these strings because the string might be the other edge of the string might be in the small intestine. So this is why these these patients need uh, endoscopy. And here is the pyloric region, the incisura angularis, and you see how the string, what how much the pressure of the string is that it cuts into. You see the string here. It cuts into the incisura angularis. Okay. So you do not, and we are not pulling the string at all. We're not pulling this string. This string has proceeded, as you saw, in the intestine. Okay, now you will see it in the esophagus as well, remaining in the esophagus. And this cat had trialism, hypersalivation. Um, of course, the string was underneath the tongue and it could not apprehend the food. Uh, very painful, uh, not only swallowing, but eating, regurgitation. And we would reach up to a point where, when we had severe esophagitis, it would form a stricture. And when they these patients are admitted to us, we have the fibrous ring that reduces, already formed, that reduces the uh, diameter of esophageal lumen. Uh, very few cases have active esophagitis. Uh, most of the cases actually that need balloon dilation and that need to undergo this procedure of uh, dilating the stricture come with an already formed uh, esophageal stricture. Uh, we can have or not esophageal lesions. Uh, we can have or not dilation of the esophageal lumen uh, cranially to the site of the stenosis. Um, and the um, mucosa is only irregular when it's neoplastic. In every other uh, case um, of stricturing, of benign strictures, the mucosa is, you know, a glistening fibrous connective uh, tissue. And in terms of neoplastic uh, disease, uh, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common primary uh, esophageal tumor in cats. Um, in the caudal, two thirds of the esophageal lumen, I'm going to show you a video of that. Of course, older cats, middle aged to older cats. Um, causal biopsies, you may try. It's a bit difficult to, to obtain. Brush cytology in these cases may be diagnostic. We managed, though, uh, to take biopsies from the patient that I will show you, uh, poor response to chemo or radiation. And what we can do in uh, every neoplastic uh, intraluminal uh, uh, procedure is palliative esophageal standing. Um, of course, they, they can migrate, the stents may migrate. And of course, you're gonna have proliferative uh, tissue uh, covering the stent at some point. And, it will, the neoplastic uh, stricture will be reformed, um, but you give time to, to the owners to realize the procedure. And you also give time to the, um, to your patient. Uh, your other, uh, your, your alternative will be to put a peg tube, you know, and feed uh, through the, the peg tube because these patients are really have weight loss and are really uh, stunted. And let's see the this 13-year-old male cat that had regurgitations and stricturing, and you see the proliferation of the neoplastic uh, uh, tissue. And to be honest, this cat had nothing else. CBC, biochemicals, uh, his demeanor, his general demeanor was so, you know, was normal. And it was such a pity. Uh, and you can put a palliative stent. This is what I suggested, but... Uh, financially, they could not afford it. Um, this is what we would do in this patient up until, you know, the proliferation would even uh, 
uh, obstruct the, the stand. We took biopsies, of course, and it was easy because it's very friable from this patient. Chronic vomiting. Any disease that might cause chronic vomiting to uh, our patients might be implicated in stricturing, like the two big categories, the gastrointestinal diseases and the extraintestinal diseases like hiatal hernias, endocrinopathies like hyperthyroidism, and also uh, diabetes ketoacidosis, for example, that causes intractable vomitings. Um, uh, IBD or chronic uh, infiltrative uh, diseases that can cause uh, chronic vomiting as well. Um, Megaesophagus cases that cause, you know, that because the, the food is retained in the esophagus and it causes esophagitis, uh, dysautonomia in cats and triadides, uh, metabolic, other metabolic disorders like kidney failure, for example, uh, chronic kidney uh, disease. Uh, all of these uh, diseases can be implicated in esophagitis and at the later stage on stricturing. Always be aware of that. And also some hyperthyroid cats will uh, be admitted to your, to your um, clinic, not with vomiting, but with regurgitating episodes due to esophageal hypomotility as well. It doesn't have to be a stricture, but hyperthyroidism does not only cause vomiting, chronic vomiting, it can cause due to uh, esophageal hypomotility, um, it can cause regurgitation episodes as well. And of course, we have the extraluminal uh, causes, which are vascular ring anomalies, and the most common is the persistent right aortic arc, um, where the esophagus is entrapped by the aorta, the ligamentum arteriosum, and the pulmonary uh, trunk, uh, the heart base uh, ventrally. You see here that we have a megaesophagus uh, just priorly to this um, uh, entrapment of the uh, esophagus, and in some cases of lymphoma and thymoma. And this is how it looks. So when you go into scoping, uh, and we have a very nice case of uh, a late onset of uh, persistent right aortic arc in a dog. If you go into our YouTube channel, Vauha uh, YouTube channel, you are going to see this case um, because it's, we were we were thinking that it's only in very young animals, and that's you know the most frequent uh, admission. But we can also have late onset of these diseases of uh, diagnosing a persistent right aortic arc in uh, dogs, especially. Okay, so uh, most of the cases, the onset of signs of clinical signs uh, is in animals less than six months of age, and shortly after winning, uh, and during their transition to the solid food. So in these uh, uh, patients, we have regurgitation, uh, they're underweight, and they could be, be presented with aspiration pneumonia due to the megaesophagus, as you see here in the x-ray, uh, that's um, cranially to the uh, entrap entrapment of the uh, esophagus. Um, we can have survey radiographs, we can have um, contrast medium radiographs, and what they show is this dilation of the esophagus cranial to the heart. So when you see that you have uh, this kind of stricturing at this site, it could lead to this congenital uh, anomaly. And of course, the uh, it's surgical. Uh, the, the management is uh, surgical. And uh, there is um, a double aortic arc. In a, there has been published a double uh, aortic arc in a Siamese cat. So yes, this disease also... Uh, stands for CATS. So in general, what do we do for the diagnosis of a stricture? Um, lateral radiographs always, uh, even if they rarely uh, reveal the stricture site, uh, especially when you have multiple, but you do them because um, you might um, get suspicious of a dilation of the uh, esophagus, for example, or to inspect the aspiration pneumonia, uh, if it exists, for example. Uh, most of the times we do uh, contrast medium uh, radiographs. So we see the esophageal dilation uh, proximal to the stricture site. And of course, endoscopy is the gold standard for strictures. 
uh, you will detect if there is an active esophagitis or not. And as we said that the strictures appear as a ring of white fibrous uh, tissue when they have already been formed. In the beginning, we could see pseudomembranes. We could see this beginning of the fold of the esophagus uh, that's starting to uh, actually uh, reducing the diameter of the uh, esophageal lumen. Uh, and of course with fluoroscopy and we do everything as a pre-op before, but just priorly to the, to to go into the endoscopic room because you want to know the underlying uh, disease. So you uh, you definitely do, or the cause of chronic vomiting, or the cause of uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or um, if there is any other underlying um, agent implicating agent in the forming of the stricture, because even if you dilate the stricture and the pathology remains, then um, you will only uh, have done nothing. You know, this will recur. So CBC, biochemical profile, electrolytes, urinalysis, T4, blood pressures. Okay. And let's go to the favorite part, which is the treatment. Uh, we can use the boogies. I've never used the boogies. Um, balloon dilation catheters. The distal tip of the endoscope, especially when it started forming, okay, or in your repeat, uh, uh, in your repetition sessions after the first dilation with balloons, you can use the tip of your scope. And of course, Nitinol stents, biodegradable self-expanding stents. We used to think that we should repeat the procedure, uh, the sessions, um, whenever the cat starts regurgitating again, which is wrong, because this means that the, the stricture will have already been formed again. So we repeat the procedure every four days to one week intervals. I mostly, I usually do it every four days. Uh, maximum. Um, and the maximum number of dilations are between, in the literature, are between 8 and uh, to 11. And then even in humans, they put stents. But um, it has been, for me, for example, I have done in small kittens, in this black kitten that you saw in the beginning, uh, we've done 14 procedures. It depends on the owner's financials and also the response. And now it's, you know, it's treated, it's a, uh, an adult, a young adult cat and has no regurgitations uh, at all. But it took 14 of these procedures. Now the boogies, the boogies, I don't use them. I have used them, you know, just to see how they work, but I don't actually like their uh, application. I don't know if any of you use boogies. Please feel free to uh, chat in the Q&A. They're narrow, long, um, they are dilators and they're available in different sizes. And what you do is that you go with a smaller size um, and you gradually uh, increase the size of the boogie that, uh, that you uh, use. Uh, in cats from nine to 12 millimeters, uh, it's proceeded gently through the narrowing uh, over a gu guide wire, of course, and always under a visualization, uh, endoscopic visualization. Um, and the initial, initial size of the boogie is approximately at the same size of the stricture because they do not have the same mechanical effect like the balloons. So we have to be very cautious with the boogies. Um, the mean uh, stricture diameter has to be five millimeters in order to use the boogies and uh, the length less than one centimeter. And sometimes we have bigger uh, strictures. We have... Uh, bigger in length, I mean, uh, longer strictures. Sometimes the strictures could be up to three centimeters, five centimeters long. Uh, it depends on the uh, cause of the esophagitis and the severity of the esophagitis. Um, and in one retrospective uh, case series of eight cats treated with boogies, the median number of procedures were, were 4.5, so around four to five procedures. And it was successful in about 75% of the cases. So um, it's actually what you're more familiar with. But there has not been um, in veterinary literature, the, uh, the, the boogies have not been used 
long enough and um, in a lot of cases so that we can have safe um, results and safe uh, and and can, can safely advise it. Okay. So boogies versus balloons, which one is safer? This is always the debate, no data and cats. Um, there is no difference in literature between boogies and uh, balloon dilations of benign esophageal uh, strictures. Uh, regarding symptomatic uh, relief, recurrence rate at 12 months, bleeding and perforations. So um, the only thing is that patients that undergo balloon dilation experience less severe post-procedure pain. That was the only difference um, actually in humans, but we have no data in, in cats. And it's a bit different, the perception of pain and also the um, the procedure per se, because the esophagus of the cat is totally different from the esophagus of the human. So we do not know. And what we mostly use are the uh, mechanical dilation balloon catheters. This is my method of choice because the forces that are uh, actually developed are radially directed rather than uh, sharing axial forces, okay, in the mucosa. And this minimizes the, the risk of rupturing the esophagus. Uh, the balloon can be placed through your working channel. It can be placed alongside your uh, working channel with visualization. And this is what I do. I never put it uh, in my working uh, channel because I might want to do other things. I want my working channel to be free and also sometimes we put some KY gel in the um, in the balloon. Uh, so I don't want to put this KY gel through my scope because it will ruin my image. Um, so most of the times I just put it alongside the endoscope. Um, this is a bit more hard to ma manipulate it and find the center of the stricture. Uh, but once you get the grip of it, it's um, you have your scope, you know, uh, and you can put other uh, forceps, for example, or whatever, whatever else you know you might need um, in in your scope. Uh, so it's easier for me to do it uh, alongside the scope. And of course, there's a, var a variety of balloon sizes. It depends on the size of the of the patient, uh, dog or a cat. And I mostly use the triple expansion uh, because it gives me the uh, the opportunity once I dilate the lumen to dilate it the second time, you know, a bit more and dilate it a bit more the third time. So the triple expansion has, for example, 10, 12 and 14 centimeters. So in the first scale, you can open it up up to 10 centimeters and then uh, 10 millimeters, sorry, and then uh, 12 and then um, and then uh, 14. OK. So in one study, the size, how do I select the size of the um, of the of the balloon, uh, the inflated diameter was four millimeter longer than the stricture uh, diameter. Okay, four millimeter bigger than the stricture uh, diameter. So these are my case series. This is how we did. You see here that this first uh, cat had no uh, lumen. The stricture had actually no lumen at all, and this is the tip of the balloon, the guide wire. Okay, uh, only the guide wire was actually um, proceeded through the, the the whole of the stricture, the uh, the diameter of the stricture, and then the balloon is proceeded, and then the balloon is inflated. Okay, inhalation anesthesia, left lateral recumbency. Okay. Flexible uh, size of, of your scope, 7.5, 8.5. Do not use your bronchoscopes uh, in dilating the, in the balloon dilation procedure. Use your scope because then you might go up and down after the dilation with a bigger diameter uh, scope. Um, and in cats, we use from 8 to 20 millimeters diameters. What if I only have money to buy one uh, balloon? Buy the 20 millimeters one. You will not be able to do the small kittens, but you will do every average uh, cat. Okay. 
Um, and you can also use it in small um, in in small breed dogs as well. So the twenty millimeters uh, diameter is something that you must have. And a eight to ten centimeters length balloon catheters we always use. Uh, sometimes six, five to ten uh, centimeters. But if you have an eight to ten, then you you can use it to uh, most of the strictures. Um, most of the cats after the procedure uh, procedure are able to to eat the very same day, and they're very hungry, even though they're very very painful. Okay, because we have caused such a trauma to the esophagus that's uh, very painful. But I will see. I will tell tell you how to minimize it. Um, please do not use the ET tubes to dilate a stricture because this is how the esophagus is ruptured most of the times. Okay, the, the ET tubes do not substitute the balloon catheters. And um, potential complications, which I only had once um, in, in a cat that had atresia, which means that there was no, no um, entrance of, of a stricture. There was actually... It was a closed tissue. We had no tissue, okay? So um, you can cause esophageal rupture, uh, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, uh, mild tissue injury, and esophageal wall bleeding, which is expected. The last, the last ones, not mild, severe uh, esophageal uh, tissue injury we have. And also we, we can have a lot of bleeding, you will see. Um, the procedure, which, what is the total, uh, number of dilations? It will depend on the initial size of the stricture, on the aggressiveness, you know, how experienced are we as endoscopists? Uh, the more experienced and the more aggressive you are, but of course you have to balance it, your aggressiveness with, you know, the gradual prog progress of the, um, of your procedure. Okay. Um, the tissue response of the affected animal. Some animals are really, some patients are really reforming the strictures in two, three days time. Uh, the chronicity of the stricture, have we um, detected it in very early stages or is it, you know, has it been there for two or three months uh, that the cat has been regurgitating? Um, the other sessions are from four to six, but as I told you, uh, in many cases, we have done more than 14 procedures and um, a higher number of sessions uh, than what is reported in the literature as maximum should be considered if you don't have uh, an alternative, like a stent, for example. Uh, what do we do after the procedure? After the procedure, we can do topical injection with a sclerotherapy and injection needle at the dilated stricture of triamcinolone. Okay, um, in four quadrants of the esophagus, and we make uh, four to six milligram per cat, and it's in half a mil aliquots. Uh, I will show you how it's done. And intralesional application of metomycin C uh, serves the same purpose. What is the prognosis? 10 to 30% of the cats are euthanized uh, despite multiple dilations. I actually have a, a bigger success rate in these uh, animals because we persuade the, the owners to go through the, the procedures, multiple procedures, and every three to four days. Um, and up to 33% of the cases can only be fed liquid di diets, which is, you know, acceptable. What is the medical treatment after you dilate the uh, the stricture? Uh, PPI inhibitors uh, in order to reduce the gastric acid secretion, uh, secretion uh, and not to have more gastroesophageal reflex lesions. Uh, sulcrophate, always use it in suspension form, not in tablets, okay, to protect the damaged, the ulcerated mucosa. Cisapride, uh, I always give cisapride after this procedure because uh, there's already an established uh, esophageal motility and we want to increase the lower esophageal uh, sphincter tone and enhance this, uh, um, not only the gastric emptying, but also enhance the esophageal motility. Um, broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, the use of systemic corticosteroids, because I know that a lot of you use uh, prednisolone in these cases, is a bit controversial. I don't use uh, prednisolone. And uh, sometimes in order to achieve analgesia, because I want these cats to eat as soon as possible, 
I put uh, two percent the docker in gel um, that's uh, diluted in, with uh, ten ml of normal saline in a syringe, and I put it throughout the length of the um, esophagus under endoscopic guidance. And of course, there's always the choice of esophageal stent placement. Uh, the the biodegradable uh, polydeoxin self-expanding stands are the ones that I choose most of the times, but uh, unfortunately they tend to uh, migrate. So it needs a bit of more expertise in order to choose the correct standing and the correct length of the stand. And also you, um, you have to have equipment like a C-arm, for example, in your uh, clinic. And let's see a case now. Uh, as well. Let's see this one. And we will go through the whole procedure. The domestic short hair. Um, hi, Ismail. Uh, we're going to talk later uh, about that. And you, get, you can have your uh, input in that as well. So we have a domestic short hair male uh, intact. So it didn't undergo any procedure, this uh, cat, anesthetic uh, episode or anything. Nine months old. Okay. Uh, the clinical history. So this cat, which is called baby, babies uh, in, uh, in, Greek was sneezing and it had bilateral copious amount of uh, mucus nasal discharge one month prior admission. Uh, it also had serous uh, ocular discharge and uh, blepharospasm. Uh, it, there was a presumptuous diagnosis of upper respiratory disease, um, but it was not confirmed, you know, with PCR, if it was herpes virus, calyce virus, uh, none of the uh, these preliminary tests were, uh, were done. And uh, it was uh, prescribed doxycycline for two weeks at 10 milligrams per kilo per os with Resolution of respiratory signs. Everything went well in terms of his upper respiratory syndrome. The ocular discharge, the nasal discharge was reduced um, and no more sneezing. Absence of oral ulcers in the physical uh, examination. Okay. Uh, ravenous appetite in the beginning, but progressively uh, after two weeks after the doxycycline administration, um, we had loss, gradual loss of appetite, hypersalivation and ptyalism. And two weeks after cessation of doxycycline, we started having uh, regurgitation episodes. And it was uh, two weeks after the cessation. You see that it took some time. It took two weeks in order for this cat to start regurgitating. Um, with an increasing frequency, first on solid foods and then on water. And of course, weight loss. Let's see what, what it does. This is what how it started. So this cat started having episodes of hypersalivation. And just right after consuming the meal, And this strange behavior that something is wrong, but but no vomitings in the beginning, huh? I'm certain that you all have videos like that. The cat is just staring at the owner that's taking the video right now. And they will start pawing uh, at the mouth. He will start pawing at the mouth as something is wrong. Sometimes the owners might lose the regurgitating episode because the cat has the regurgitation and it goes right up and re-consumes uh, the food. So in the beginning, there were no regurgitating episodes. This was the first video uh, that uh, the owner has uh, sent to uh, 
uh, the uh, clinician to the referring uh, clinician. Okay, and let's see how it progressed over one week time. The cat has lost more weight, dehydrated even more. And you see that the tylism and uh, has become a bit more severe. But now, in the end of all this episode, we do have regurgitations, okay? And it was very, very passive. You will see that it's very, it comes passively. So it's just an extension of the neck and it has been given dry food, as you see here. So this was the beginning that it could not tolerate the dry food. So after that, they would give, you know, canned food. And even that, they could not tolerate the canned food either. And the period now, as it progresses, is even shorter. So it took some time in the beginning for the, uh, the cat to regurgitate. But now it's becoming, you know shorter the interval between the meal and the regurgitation it's expelled very very easily physical uh, examination findings as i have already told you always use the muscle condition score and the body condition score in order to um, evaluate your patients and uh, we had a mild dehydration, around 7%, uh, body condition score, 3 out of 9, muscle condition score, B. Uh, the, th the thyroid gland palpation was normal, and it was a very, very young animal, 9 months old, but we always do it as a part of our physical examination. Mucous membranes, normal, and a sinus tachycardia. So in every case that we have, we have to create a problem list regurgitation, the first problem, tealism, and anorexia. And the regurgitation in cats could be the idiopathic functional, could be due to uh, idiopathic functional hypomotility and megaesophagus, uh, primary functional dysmotility, like in the CMEs and in the Bengal cats, esophagitis, which causes secondary um, esophageal dysmotility, hypomotility, uh, toxicity causing megaesophagus, like lead toxicity or uh, botulism, uh, congenital defects, as we said, that cause stricturing, like the vascular ring anomalies, type 1 sliding hiatal hernias, feline dysautonomia, myasthenia gravis, uh, gravis um, with thymoma or not, especially in Abyssinian and Somali cat, toxoplasmosis, for those of you who do not know that, um, can cause regurgitation out of dysmotility, esophageal dysmotility, uh, foreign body because of the uh, embedded uh, foreign body in the esophagus, hyperthyroidism and uh, benign esophageal uh, stricture already formed. And the hematology results, you see that we have mild subtle changes, not you know something very, very prominent like of course, we have a neutropenia, but it's not severe neutropenia. Uh, mild lymphocytosis, which is, you know, for cats, it's a bit normal to have lymphocytosis. And uh, monocytosis, very mild. And I know these are Greek, but you can see the, uh, the English ones because they were performed here in Greece. Uh, but you can see the English uh, abbreviations here. So the creatinine, the albumins, total proteins, the transaminas, the phosphorus, calcium, potassium, sodium, and the BUN, all normal. Okay. And FIV and for leukemia virus tested negative. Urinalysis, specific gravity of uh, 1050, 
it's normal for cats. And also, uh, I have to remind you that uh, the cat was a bit dehydrated, even though the urea was normal, you saw. Uh, inactive sentiment and uh, no proteinuria, uh, the urine culture negative. And let's go to the imaging. So we took, in the beginning, a plain radiograph. And you can see here, uh, this in the, in the uh, rear lungs, in the rear thorac thoracic uh, fields, that there was something, you know, we were questioning, is it a sliding hernia? Is it, you know, something like a, um, a dilation of the esophagus there? Is it um, lung disease, you know, pneumonopathy? Um, and the abdomen was normal. And then we did the uh, contrast medium, uh, lateral with gastrographing. It was an esophagogram actually. So there was a stricture formation right cranially to the lower esophageal sphincter. And that's esophagography at five minutes after consumption of the uh, contrast medium. And this is 10 minutes after uh, the um, after the, the contrast medium, and that's 20 minutes. So the stricture is here, but some contrast medium passes uh, in the stomach. And of course we did um, a CT scan and it verified actually the mural thickening of the esophagus and the esophageal stricture, uh, stricturing. Uh, and the thickening of the esophageal wall. And we did a, a total body CT scan. So we found out uh, an hepatomegaly as well. And uh, a bilateral unstructured is interstitial pneumonopathy, um, which could be due to the uh, upper respiratory syndrome that it had uh, priorly, but it was like a bronchopneumonia, like asthma, asthma-like lesions. Okay, and let's see the stricture. So you see that uh, there is a lot of saliva and foamy material. We have active esophagitis. The esophageal lumen is not uh, glistening and uh, normal. We have uh, erosions, superficial erosions. And we will reach the stricture, which is proximal to the lower esophageal uh, sphincter. And you see that we're going from a dilated esophagus to this kind of a stricture. How can I assess the, the length of the stricture? I can put a forceps through uh, my the working channel of my scope and open the jaws of the forceps in order to calculate you know the diameter or I can put a Foley catheter for example or a urinary catheter in order to assess um, the um, not only uh, the the length the diameter of the of the stricture so you see that we have a very well formed stricture and now you see this red doubt because I'm trying to see if I can pass through the stricture which was not possible of course um, and we would need to do balloon dilations I caused a trauma here please don't do that uh, by yourselves uh, so what I should have done is go out and put a balloon catheter, which we did. So this is the first session. And you will see that we have caused, so we put the balloon in the middle of the stricture. We proceeded up until it reaches the middle uh, in of the length of the balloon. Okay, and then we start inflating, either with water or with uh, air. With water, you have a better hydraulic effect, uh, but with air, it's safer. I do it with water. I fill my balloon with water, but you have to dry it really well afterwards. Okay. And uh, we keep it for at least 30 to 40 seconds. And up until we see that blood is coming out in the circumference of the, uh, of the stricturing. 
you have to understand that this in this procedure, you will have to cause trauma, major trauma. So don't be afraid to cause it. Otherwise, your procedure will not be successful. So if I had to say one pitfall, you know, uh, one common mistake that people do in these procedures is that they're scared, so they do not dilate the balloon, or they choose a balloon uh, diameter that's smaller than it should, so they do not um, cause big trauma to the to the esophagus. And we have restructuring, very easy restructuring after that. You see the bubbles and the blood that's coming out. Don't be scared. This is what you're supposed to do. Okay. And this is right after the first procedure. You see my urine catheter here. You see what how big of a uh, of a tearing we ha we have caused to the esophagus. Okay. And you see a urine catheter with my zilocaine infusion. Uh, in order for the cats to be comfortable to eat right after uh, the procedure. So I'm putting my Zillocaine. Um, you can see that here throughout the length of the esophagus. And then three days later, the second uh, balloon dilation, because I don't wait for, for more days, you see the damage, it has reformed. It has reformed not to the initial small size that it was, but it was a, a big stricture as well. So this time I, I went in more aggressively, as you see, and into the stomach. These are This is blood coming from the esophagus that's digested, okay? So don't worry. It's not gastric ulcers. And now what I'm doing is I'm going up and down, up and down with my scope. And I put a bigger scope, a bigger diameter scope up and down in the stricture. Okay, in order to dilate it even more. But you see that this time I was a bit more aggressive and I caused more trauma to the esophagus. Do I remove this tissue here? No, I don't. I do not remove this tissue with a forceps. I just leave it like that. And again, what you can do is some triamcinolone, but of course this is a very, very um, lengthy uh, stricture. So um, most of the times we do triamcinolone in quadrants. Uh, when we have uh, a stricture uh, that's, not, that, that's shorter. Okay, but you, of course you can do here circumferentially triamcinolone injections if you want. But this is a big tearing of the uh, esophagus. And now it has a diameter that the cat can definitely eat and uh, pass the food. Okay, let's see now. My residents were really, really scared when they saw, you know, this uh, destruction that we have caused. But this is what you're supposed to do, as I said. And I'm not just staying there looking. I'm going up and down now. Now I'm doing, um, actually, after the balloon dilation, I am multiplying my effect. Okay. And let's see now what happened seven days after admission, which is three days after the second session. Let's see the third session, three days later now. You see the dates as well. Let's see what happened. This is pre-dilation, before dilating. This is the tracheal uh, identification. Let's see if it's it has reformed or not. And it has reformed, but to a lesser extent than the first times. You remember that it was, you know, less than... Uh, not one centimeter, it was even even smaller, the stricture, the initial stricture. So now we do have a lumen. You see that it's okay, maybe canned food or um, food that's been diluted with water can pass, but we're not happy. 
we still have to dilute it, to dilate it. Okay, again, the third session. And the stomach looks looks fine. And let's see the post dilation. Let's see what we have post dilation. You see blood coming. So this means that we have a very successful procedure. So we have tear up the whole uh, length of the esophagus again. And of course, every um, after every procedure, we give sulcrophage, we'll give an antibiotic. It would be great if you most of them, you could do them injectional, for example, the antibiotics. And then in cats, they're so problematic. We will have the feline injectional site sarcomas with the injections. But anyway, in these cases, which I'm trying to do the antibiotics um, in injection form, the less peels, um, they take from the from the mouth, the better it is. Uh, the sulcrophate in uh, suspension, not in peel, because it doesn't have this coverage uh, of the esophageal mucosa if you give it in uh, in peel for. Okay, so we cause again the trauma. And it took these three uh, dilations, actually, this cat, in order to have um, a circumference that's good enough uh, to have canned food, for example. The owners were happy with that, so that was great. Oops, sorry. And so we gave uh, amoxicillin plus clavulanic acid, sulcrophate suspension at this uh, dosage, Cisapride in order to increase the uh, the motility, low fat diet because it uh, enhances the the motility uh, of the of the stomach, the gastric emptying. Uh, from, fed from hide, this is a a new one, um, like the Bailey's chair in dogs. This is like you know um, a device for cats that have mega esophagus or that we want them to to eat from a height, which is not absolutely necessary in these cases because they don't, uh, they resume their uh, capacity of esophageal motility, but in the beginning, it's very, very handy. Um, and of course, triamcinolone uh, aliquots in, uh, in forms of injections during your endoscopic procedures. So this is pretty much everything. Um, Powell, I see that you have your hand raised. If you want to uh, to ask something, please do. Um, another common mistake is that a lot of you um, put the 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 balloon through the scope, and this gives you um, less visibility of your sight and uh, less capability of being less flexibility in manipulations. When you put it alongside, it needs a bit more proficiency in order to get it in the stricture because a lot of people are laughing at me and they're saying, I mean, there's only one hole. Why the balloon cannot be inserted in there? Because the balloon is not, you know, you have to have a guide wire and put it through uh, on the gu guide wire if you want to be really, really uh, targeted where to 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 orient it. If you have any other uh, questions, I'll be happy to answer. And even if you don't think about it now, you can always email me. You can always email me cases to discuss um, and share, you know, knowledge and opinions. And please uh, tell me if you prefer this time for the webinars or maybe um, 
during noon. Don't forget to say that because we will proceed according to your answers. Uh, Ishmael, yes, I did have. Uh, the question is, have you ever had a case of perforation after this procedure? Of course I did. As I told you, I have a cat. I had a cat with atresia, total atresia. And um, we should perforate it. There was no alternative. And what do you do when you perforate? You have to have a surgeon handy because you're in the thorax right now and creating pneumothorax. I had once in a cat and once in a puppy uh, in a very young puppy that had a foreign body for two, three weeks there. So, and also it's easier to have a perforation in neoplastic disorders because the um, the tissue is not healthy, you know. The esophagus is an amazing organ and it's very difficult to, to perforate. Very difficult. I've done many of these such procedures. And I only remember two or three perforations. So don't be afraid to do that. And if you don't want to have, you know, perforations in the beginning when you're doing your um, your procedures, try it with a balloon of less uh, diameter. Okay, you will not have the effect that you want, the therapeutic effect that you want, uh, but um, you will definitely, uh, you know, start to do the procedure and once you feel safe then you will uh choose you will be more aggressive as i was uh thank you very much for for uh attending anna uh, as well so how long after the operation is allowed to feed and what we feed as you see here the cat we feed them as soon as they're waking up you know two or three hours after the operation um and uh we are feeding them we are starting off after the it depends on which session we are if we are after our first balloon dilation session we start off with canned food um and most of the times because the esophagus is ulcerated we start with dilated canned food as here as you see the cat here um and then as we progress into the dilations, let's say the fourth session, uh, we can try canned food without dilution. And then in the fifth uh, session or sixth dilation, we can try dry food, but soaked dry food, and then the dry food. Okay, you, you will go gradually. And I mostly use low fat uh, foods, like the ID low fat or the gastrointestinal low fat of Royal, uh, canine, the can, uh, royal canine, the canned food. So I, I use low fat diets. The gastrointestinal diet is an easily digestible diet is, is very good. Special meatballs. What, what do you mean special meatballs? Special meatballs of what? Yes, for dogs, we can use canned food as well. We use canned food, low-fat diet, canned food. So they eat straight after the procedure, straight after the procedure. Okay. Because these animals are, have lost weight, are malnourished, so we do not, and especially for cats, you know that there is a huge problem with uh, hepatic lipidosis. Okay. So you don't want to have, and you saw that this cat had, uh, the one that we saw in my case, had epitomegaly. So you do not want to keep a cat unfed for more than two or three days because you will encounter other progress, uh, other problems in the, in the long run. Like hepatic lipidosis and then, you know, a vicious cycle will start of anorexia, vomiting and restructuring. We want to keep them very, very well nourished. And always, always think about the refeeding syndrome. If your animal is anorectic for more than, you know, three or four days or five days, uh, when you start, when you reinitiate food, please check your phosphorus levels and check your potassium levels because uh, the refeeding syndrome can cause hypo, uh, severe hypophosphatemia and hypokalemia, and this could cause hemolysis. 
afterwards. Okay, you can see the hematocrit levels going down and you will wonder why. I mean, the cat was eating normally and the stricture is, you know, dilated and why do I have hemolysis right now? Why do I have a very, very low HCT? So always think about the refeeding syndrome, especially in cats. Any other questions? Let's see. No. Thank you very much, Justine. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all of you. And I hope to, at some point, to meet you uh, in person. So, Jason, I think that uh, the audience needs the uh, the the webinars at this time. Uh, strictures will recur despite repeated esophageal dilations. Yes, unfortunately, they will recur. This is their job to recur in the initial sessions. But after six or eight sessions, for example, you will have, uh, but every time that they reform macram, it will be with a bigger diameter. So yes, they will reform, but never to the initial small diameter that you have. They will reform, but with a bigger, gradually bigger and bigger, increasingly bigger and bigger diameter. So at, at one point, you will reach up to a diameter that is acceptable for life and that is acceptable for consumption of either solid food or even canned food, you know. If an animal, if the diameter does not allow the dry food, some owners are really, really happy to. You saw that in, in the literature, 30% of the cases will only have to be fed canned food, even after multiple procedures. And it's even worse when you have multiple strictures, when you don't have only one stricture to dilate, because they might, um, the, the, um, the level of, uh, of the diameter of the two strictures might be totally different. You might dilate one stricture very well with a uh, satisfying diameter and the rest, the, the rest of the strictures or the other stricture with a less diameter and that's a problem. The next uh, webinar will be end of October. End of October, we will have the next one. And we will see what it will be. It will probably be about colonoscopy. Now, we're going to go to the large intestine. And I always want you to know endoscopic procedures, but in liaison associated with internal medicine, because this is what you're going to see in practice. This is why we're, we're not only saying about um, endoscopic, we, we discuss endoscopic cases, but under the prisma of internal medicine as well. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Masliki. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk next month. Yeah, yeah. Next and please month. give all the participants my email whoever wants, I will probably write it in the Q and A's here. Can I write it in the Q and A's? Yeah, I can write it and- uh, <clears throat> Please uh, write I, it. Yeah, I wanna say that uh, every attendees will receive the record of today's webinar. And if you haven't received it in one month, you can contact me, <clears throat> okay will be sent by our distribution in your region. Very good. And please share my email for people that will okay, I can. want to Micram, your Greek are so much better than my uh, where are you from? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, if you still have some questions, you can ask, you can contact us from the social media like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. 
you too. Yes, definitely. And we have to highlight, Jason, that you also have webinars in Spanish. So for those of you who are Latin origin, of Latin origin, if you want to, to listen to um, experts in uh, Spanish, uh, in, in Latin languages, then Alha offers also these uh, webinars. And the next one is when? On the 11th of October or 14th? Uh, the next. Let me check. Uh... Let me check. Next is uh, uh, October fourth. October fourth. Yeah. The world, the world animal, the, the world animals day, <laughs> which is yeah. a very very good choice. So close. If you are if from Latin, speaking Latin, <clears throat> you can come. Yes, October fourth. Yeah. Okay. You can come to our Latin uh, webinar. It's okay. That's great. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Jason.